My ex-wife convinced my sister to help her hide my son for eight years by saying I was abusive, but her new husband found her secret. I, 38 million, never thought I'd be writing this post, but I need to know if I'm overreacting. This is a long story, but I need to share all the details to paint the full picture. I met Sarah, 36F, during our junior year of college. I was working part-time at a campus coffee shop to pay for my education while she came from a wealthy family. Despite our different backgrounds, we clicked immediately. She was different from other rich kids, down-to-earth, genuine, and didn't care about my financial status. We dated for three years before getting married right after graduation. My family loved Sarah, especially my sister Amy, 34F. Growing up, Amy and I were extremely close. Our parents died in a car accident when I was 20 and Amy was 16. I became her legal guardian, worked multiple jobs to put her through high school, and later helped her get through college. We only had each other, so when Sarah came into our lives, I was overjoyed that Amy finally had a sister figure. Sarah's family was a different story. Her father owned a chain of luxury hotels, and her mother came from old money. They never approved of me. At our wedding, her mother made several comments about how Sarah was marrying beneath her status. I ignored it all because Sarah stood up for me and assured me that her love was all that mattered. The first few years of marriage were perfect. I worked hard and climbed the corporate ladder while Sarah started her own interior design business. We bought a modest house, which Sarah turned into our dream home. Amy lived with us for a year after college when she struggled to find a job. Sarah and Amy became inseparable, shopping together, taking weekend trips, and sharing everything like real sisters. When Tommy was born five years into our marriage, everything started changing. Sarah's parents became increasingly involved in our lives. They bought expensive gifts we couldn't afford, made comments about our middle-class neighborhood being unsafe for their grandson, and constantly pressured me to join their hotel business. They wanted us to move closer to them, send Tommy to private schools they chose, and basically take over our parenting. I stood my ground because I wanted to raise my son normally, not in their privileged bubble. Sarah initially supported me, but gradually began siding with her parents. We started having arguments about Tommy's future. Her parents would show up unannounced, reorganize our house and criticize everything, from my long working hours to the brand of diapers we used. Then came the day I'll never forget. I was at work when I got a call from Tommy's preschool saying Sarah hadn't picked him up. Concerned, I left work early. When I got home, the house felt wrong. Walking through each room, I realized certain things were missing. Photos, documents, some of Sarah's clothes, Tommy's favorite toys. I called repeatedly but got no answer. Her phone was off. I called her parents, who claimed they hadn't heard from her. Amy rushed over and helped me search the neighborhood, call hospitals, and file a missing person report. The police initially didn't take it seriously, suggesting Sarah might have gone to visit family. Days turned into weeks. I hired private investigators, posted on social media, contacted every friend and relative. Amy helped organize search parties, put up missing posters, and kept the social media campaign active. Sarah's parents acted worried, but something felt off about their concern. For eight years, I lived in limbo. I kept Tommy's room exactly as he left it, with his favorite stuffed dinosaur still sitting on his bed. Every birthday, I bought him presents and stored them in his closet. Every Christmas, I set a place for him at the table. Amy would sit with me during these moments, holding my hand and promising we'd find him. I dated a few times over the years, but every relationship failed because I couldn't move on. How could I, when half of my heart was missing? I threw myself into work, built a successful career, but success felt hollow without my son to share it with. Throughout these years, Amy remained my rock. She moved to a house nearby to help me cope. She organized birthday memorials for Tommy, kept his case active on missing children websites, and never let me lose hope. Or so I thought. Last month, 
after my promotion to CEO made local news, I received an anonymous email. The sender identified herself as Sarah's former assistant and attached recent pictures of Tommy, my son, playing soccer at school events, celebrating birthdays, moments I should have been part of. She revealed that Sarah had been living in Switzerland and the bomb that shattered my world. Amy had known their location all along. The evidence was undeniable. Bank transfers, email exchanges, travel records. Everything showed that Amy had been actively helping Sarah hide. She visited them regularly, spent holidays with them, all while watching me suffer in search. She even helped Sarah set up her new life abroad. When I confronted Amy, she broke down. She admitted everything but claimed she did it to protect Tommy. She said Sarah had convinced her that I would ruin Tommy's life with my middle-class values and stubbornness. The same sister I raised, put through college, and supported through every hardship had betrayed me in the worst possible way. I haven't spoken to Amy since that day. I've hired international lawyers to help me find my son. My friends say I'm being too harsh, that Amy was manipulated by Sarah and her family. But how do you forgive someone who watched you suffer for eight years and helped keep your child away from you? Am I the a-hole for cutting my sister out of my life? First, I want to thank everyone who commented on my last post. The support and advice helped me stay strong through what came next. A lot has happened in these two weeks, and I need to share it all. My lawyers finally traced Sarah and Tommy to an affluent suburb of Geneva, Switzerland. They've been living in a massive villa overlooking the lake. Sarah remarried a Swiss businessman named Marcus three years after leaving me. Tommy is now 13, goes to an elite international school, and mainly speaks French and German. He understands English, but isn't fluent anymore, another connection to me that was deliberately erased. The legal process is moving forward, but international custody cases are complex. Switzerland has different laws and Sarah's new husband has a lot of political connections there. Still, my lawyers are confident about building a strong case, especially with the new information that came to light last week. Amy showed up at my office unannounced. Security called to ask if I wanted to see her, and something made me say yes. She looked terrible, like she hadn't slept in days. She carried a thick manila envelope, and before I could tell her to leave, she started revealing things that made my blood run cold. Sarah's parents had orchestrated everything from the start. They paid Amy $50,000 to help with their plan, a sum she desperately needed because of a gambling addiction I never knew about. She showed me bank statements proving the payment, emails discussing the plan, and even a contract Sarah's parents made her sign. The contract outlined her role in helping Sarah escape and maintaining the deception. Amy explained how Sarah's parents had been working against me for years before Sarah left. They tried bribing me multiple times through different business associates, offering me money to walk away from the marriage. I never knew because I always shut down any conversation about selling my company or joining their business. The most shocking revelation was about Sarah's second marriage. Her parents had introduced her to Marcus at a charity gala six months before she left me. They had planned everything, the timing, the escape, even which school Tommy would attend in Switzerland. Sarah's mother had already bought property there and set up bank accounts. Amy also revealed the lengths Sarah's parents went to destroy me. They hired private investigators to follow me for three years after Sarah left hoping to find evidence of anything they could use against me if I ever found them. They tried planting drugs in my car once, but their plan failed because I sold the car a week before they could do it. They even paid people to try to seduce me, hoping to prove I had moved on and didn't care about finding Tommy. Through her tears, Amy told me about her monthly contributions to Tommy's life. She'd been using part of her salary to buy him gifts, telling him they were from me. She showed me pictures of Tommy opening Christmas and birthday presents, thinking his dad had sent them. She claimed she did this because she felt guilty about keeping him from me, but it just made me angrier. She had no right to pretend to be me. The worst part of all was learning what Tommy believes about me. Sarah created an elaborate story about me being abusive and unstable. 
she used my career success against me, telling Tommy that I cared more about money and power than family. Every promotion I earned while searching for him became proof in her narrative that I had abandoned them for success. Amy broke down completely when she showed me videos of Tommy. He's in his school play, scoring goals in soccer matches and winning science competitions. All these moments I should have witnessed firsthand. She kept these videos from me for years while watching me suffer through every missed milestone. She claims she's trying to make amends now. She sold her house and wants to give me the money for legal fees. She's offered to testify against Sarah's parents and provide all evidence of their conspiracy. She says she realizes now how wrong she was and that she was manipulated by Sarah's family. My friends think I should reconsider cutting her off since she's trying to make things right. They say her evidence could be crucial in getting Tommy back. But every time I look at her, I see every Christmas morning I spent alone, every birthday I celebrated with an empty chair, and every night I lay awake wondering if my son was safe. The lawyers are building a case using Amy's evidence, but I don't know if I can ever forgive her. She wasn't just an unwitting participant. She actively helped destroy my relationship with my son. She watched me break down year after year while knowing exactly where he was. Now I'm faced with an impossible situation. I need her testimony to strengthen my custody case, but the thought of being around her makes me physically ill. How do you work with someone who betrayed you so completely? I don't know what's worse. The years I spent not knowing where Tommy was or knowing now that my own sister helped keep him from me. After months of legal battles, I finally got court-approved visitation with Tommy in Switzerland. The first meeting was in a supervised setting at a family court facility in Geneva. I was nervous and excited, but nothing prepared me for how it went. Tommy refused to even be in the same room with me at first. He sat next to his stepdad, Marcus, and wouldn't make eye contact. The court-appointed supervisor tried to help, but Tommy was clearly uncomfortable. He answered my questions with one-word responses in broken English, which hurt more than if he'd said nothing at all. I had four more supervised visits over the next few weeks. Each one was difficult, but I kept going. During the fifth visit, something unexpected happened. While Sarah was talking to the supervisor and Tommy was in the restroom, Marcus pulled me aside. He looked nervous but determined. Marcus told me he discovered the truth by accident two months ago. He was renovating their home office when he found Sarah's old journals hidden behind a false panel in a drawer. He read them and learned everything, how her parents orchestrated my son's kidnapping, how Sarah knew I was a good father, and how guilty she felt about leaving. He showed me photos he'd taken of the journals on his phone. Sarah had written detailed entries about watching my TV interviews during the search, about nearly calling me countless times, and about lying to Tommy. She wrote about her parents' manipulation and pressure, documenting how they threatened to cut her off if she didn't follow their plan. Marcus turned out to be different from what I'd imagined. He genuinely had no idea about the truth when he married Sarah. Like everyone else, he believed her story about escaping an abusive marriage. He started secretly recording conversations after finding the journals, gathering evidence of Sarah's lies and her parents' involvement. The most damning evidence was a recording from a private party at their house. Sarah's father, drunk on expensive wine, bragged to his friends about how they got rid of the middle-class son-in-law who was embarrassing their family. He laughed about how easy it was to manipulate Amy with money and praised Sarah for playing her part perfectly. Marcus gave me copies of everything, the journal photos, recordings, emails, and bank statements showing payments to various people involved in the conspiracy. He said he tried confronting Sarah once about the journals, but she destroyed them and threatened to take Tommy away from him too if he ever mentioned them again. This revelation led to a huge fight between Sarah and Marcus. She found out he had contacted my lawyers and completely lost control. She tried to take Tommy and run again, but Marcus had already warned their household staff and security. Tommy witnessed her meltdown, heard her screaming about the lies, and locked himself in his room for three days. Tommy refused to come out except for food. He missed school, 
and wouldn't talk to anyone. Marcus told me that after Tommy finally emerged, he started asking questions about me. He found old family photos online and spent hours looking at pictures from when he was a baby. His whole reality was crumbling. Sarah's carefully constructed narrative is falling apart. My lawyers are using Marcus's evidence to build an even stronger case. Sarah's parents are facing criminal charges in multiple countries for international kidnapping and Sarah's carefully constructed narrative is falling apart. My lawyers are using Marcus's evidence to build an even stronger case. Sarah's parents are facing criminal charges in multiple countries for international kidnapping and conspiracy. The evidence of their bribery attempts and harassment has made things worse for them. Amy continues cooperating with authorities, detailing how Sarah's parents manipulated and paid her. While her testimony is helpful, I still can't bring myself to speak to her. Marcus says Tommy asked about her recently, wondering why his aunt helped hide him from me. I've rented an apartment in Geneva to be close to Tommy during this process. Marcus has been unexpectedly supportive, helping create opportunities for Tommy and me to spend time together. Sarah is still trying to maintain control, but her influence over Tommy is weakening as more truths come to light. For the first time in eight years, I feel hope. It's not easy. Tommy is confused and hurting, but he's beginning to ask questions about his past, about me. That's more than I had three months ago. This will be my final update. The past six months have brought significant changes to all of our lives. The court case concluded last month after reviewing all the evidence, including Marcus's recordings and Amy's testimony. The judge awarded me joint custody of Tommy, which means I get him every other weekend and half of his school holidays. Sarah's parents were charged with international kidnapping and conspiracy in multiple countries. They're facing serious jail time, and their business empire is crumbling. Most of their partners have cut ties, and their reputation in the business world is destroyed. Tommy and I started seeing a family counselor who specializes in parental alienation cases. It's a slow process, but we're making progress. I've moved permanently to Geneva, bought a house near a school, and started working for my company. Tommy still lives primarily with Sarah and Marcus, but I'm now a regular part of his life. Sarah's life fell apart after Marcus filed for divorce. She tried claiming she was a victim of her parents' manipulation, but Marcus's evidence proved she was an active participant. She lost her interior design business after the scandal broke, and most of her wealthy friends distanced themselves from her. The divorce settlement was brutal for Sarah. Marcus's lawyers used her involvement in my son's kidnapping to argue that she was morally unfit for any significant settlement. As a result, she lost access to most of the wealth she gained through their marriage. Now she's living in a small apartment, a far cry from her luxury villa. Amy continues to try and make amends. She paid back all the money she received from Sarah's parents, plus interest. She sends letters through our cousins, detailing every visit she had with Tommy over the past eight years. Part of me wants to read them, but I always end up storing them away unopened. Some wounds are still too fresh. Tommy is slowly accepting the truth about his past. He found his old room in my house, the one I kept unchanged all these years. When he saw the birthday presents I bought him every year, he broke down. It was the first time he hugged me voluntarily. Last week, during our weekend together, Tommy asked me if I hated his mom. I told him honestly that I don't hate her, but I hate what she did to us. He seemed to understand. He also asked about Amy, wondering why his aunt would help hide him. I didn't have an answer for that one. Marcus has been surprisingly supportive throughout everything. He helps maintain stability for Tommy and even encourages him to spend extra time with me when possible. He's selling the villa and moving to a smaller house, saying he wants Tommy to understand that life isn't all about wealth and status. I'm different now. Eight years of searching for my son changed me fundamentally. The betrayal by Amy and Sarah's manipulation taught me hard lessons about trust. 
but watching Tommy play soccer in my backyard or helping him with his English homework makes all that pain feel distant. Some people, including my extended family, think I'm too harsh for not forgiving Amy or being more understanding of Sarah's position. But they didn't live through eight years of birthdays with a missing child. They didn't wake up every day wondering if their son was alive or dead. For now, I'm focusing on rebuilding my relationship with Tommy. Everything else, the anger, the betrayal, the lost years, can wait. Sometimes Tommy asks about the past, and I'm always honest with him, but I let him set the pace. That's enough for now.